Um, uh, my name is Julian Bowery. I'm regional manager for Innovate UK. For those of you who don't know, we're the National Innovation Agency. Uh, and for the next three days, we're going to be uh, talking about how Innovate UK and local partners are supporting uh, and can support innovative companies uh, to grow, uh, and particularly in the South East Midlands. Obviously, this is a virtual event. Uh, I'm the regional manager for the East and South East Midlands. For the last three years, I've organised events up in Leicester and Nottingham, and I'm just really pleased that this year we've managed to uh, agree with Semlet that we'll come and do the event uh, in the South East Midlands. Um, and so uh, a big thank you to Emmanuel, Karen and uh, Taylor at the at Semlet for helping organise this alongside with Anita and Aileen at the KTN and Lucy uh, back at the ranch at Innovate UK. So we tried to cover the things that are really important uh, that you're telling us as innovative businesses are really important to you uh, and also there are exhibitions so please do sign up to the exhibitions where you can have conversations one-to-one -one conversations uh, with I think we've got at least 15 exhibitors who are really keen to, keen to talk to you about how we can support that. Uh, so um, please do stay on board. Um, please do contribute. So use, use the chat function, as Anita was saying, to ask questions. Um, you'll probably, by the end of the three days, if you stick with me, would stick with this, you'll see far too much of me than you really want. Uh, but I'm going to be the sort of host uh, for most of the sessions over the three days. Hopefully, uh, I'm not seeing a <clears throat> dramatic drain off of attendees uh, at the prospect of that. Um, but that's enough of me. So uh, I'm really pleased that we're going to have this first session. We'll have three speakers, then a Q&A, then we'll have a break, uh, and then we'll have another three speakers and a Q&A, and we'll finish probably about 12.15 or so. Uh, so without more ado, I'm really pleased to introduce the first panel of the speakers. And I think first up is uh, David Bailey, who is a SEMLET board member. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much indeed, Julian. I'm very pleased to be here. Semlep is delighted to be involved in this event where the vision for today is profiting from innovation. And I think there was a little bit of scrabbling around in the background to find anybody who could put those two words together. Um, profit is a subject very close to my heart. I'm an accountant and I've had several software companies of my own over the years. I know those profits were the result of painful attention to the process of innovation. And last year, I put that experience into some useful form and spent a year formally studying innovation methods, management and outcomes in Sweden, Britain and Italy, and wrote a 100,000 word course on innovation management and ISO 56000, which is hard to stay awake through at first, but uh, has its good moments. So I may or may not also be an expert in innovation management, a fun journey that never stops. At least while doing that, I found some quotes and my favourite for today is from Jeff Bezos, which in 2016, he said, I believe we're in the best place in the world to fail. And we've had plenty of practice where failure and innovation are inseparable twins. So I hope during this event, you'll find the right place and the right people who can help you shift the, the balance from fail to value. In my very brief introduction and keynote, I'll try and highlight three of the five things given in the reasons for attending what value for innovation means, why this region, and who wants to help you. Now, let me make the slides work. Obtaining value from innovation is the dividing line between merely having an idea and truly innovating, and it's leadership focus on realising value from innovation that demonstrates commitment. Organisations that succeed in obtaining value from innovation are consistently more profitable and sustainable. And KTN and Innovate help identify opportunities and qualify your concepts. They can provide well-evidenced challenges based on national and regional strategic priorities. And they have proven requirements based on very large amounts of evidence. And you might look at all the different ways in which you could innovate as opposed to purely invent on this little slide here. However, the actual process of innovation is up to you, as is the area in which you wish to focus your innovation. 
you can see on this slide, six areas where other people have chosen to focus. And I don't just want people to broaden their thinking away from invention into innovation as a much broader concept. KTN Innovate and SEMLEP can help you through the innovation journey and support you with best practice guidelines. They can enhance your resilience. They can add to your cash flows. They can provide access to skills. They can find you the perfect location and they can add to your knowledge. And I do encourage you all to encourage with all of them, to engage with all of them. Top management should be able to demonstrate both leadership in innovation and commitment to realizing value and a clear strategy to profit from innovation should be embedded throughout your organization and every organization in this region as we try to recover from the pandemic and find whatever benefits leaving the EU might reveal for us. It would be my recommendation that you continue to undertake innovation activities where there is evidence of an opportunity, evidence of a long-term benefit, and a value of learning that clearly outweighs the risk-weighted cost of undertaking that innovation. So who am I? I'm delighted to be here in the role of SEMLET board member. And as a public-private partnership steered by a business-led board, our role as a local enterprise partnership is to help the economy thrive across the Southeast Midlands, including Northampton, Bedford and Milton Keynes. The South East Midlands is one of the most innovative parts of the country, which if I can make this slide work, that'll be fine. Uh, and is at the forefront of cutting edge developments in the future of mobility, clean growth, and in the intersections between both of those areas. It is leading the way on low carbon flight and the use of hydrogen in freight vehicles. It leads on connected and autonomous vehicles, electric vehicle infrastructure, and innovations in last mile delivery. So what is this region? And I, I, I sometimes struggle if I say I'm in the SEMLEP region, it's really hard for people to draw a line around that on the map. But here are some headlines. There is a strong, buoyant and productive economy in this region. Um, the slides will be available to you, but let me just pick on two things that really make me smile. 90% of businesses started in this region survived the first year. That is a substantial advantage for innovators, and it speaks volumes to the resilience, support and business ecosystem that exists. 3%, one in 30 of all businesses in the UK start here, and that's way above the population weighted average. This genuinely is a region of entrepreneurs and innovators. If you start here and choose to grow here, you're among friends. And not on this slide are the staggering number of university spin outs in the peripheral area around our region. So the Oxford to Cambridge Arc Universities Group um, was spinning out about three companies a month from each location when um, and I'm sure there'll be a speaker who'll correct me on that. But um, it's not just this region, but around our region is also powerhouses of innovation. And this is the region that has the space and support to grow and scale in. We're in a hard time. There's no getting away from that. We have to be realistic. I can't just say this is all good. But in a hard time, that is exactly when we must innovate. We must all acknowledge the impacts of the pandemic and the impact it's having on innovation levels for several years to come. And this graph is actually a kind of sharp intake of breath because unless companies push innovation, there will be a multi-year setback for industry, creativity and profitability in the UK. However, on the other hand, we've seen incredible levels of innovation in previous years. And just thinking of some local companies that have pivoted to support the pandemic crisis with PPE or ventilators, um, without being sort of too personal, I'd pick on Pelly Biothermal, little company in Leighton Buzzard that provides temperature control packaging to get new vaccines delivered safely. And there are dozens of others who've risen to the challenge um, of the pandemic. And the pandemic alone isn't the only reason to innovate. We should innovate because everything has changed. Uh, we are here at this virtual conference, and I don't think anybody would have considered doing this two years ago. So what is SEMLEP doing to help? So part of our role as the local enterprise partnership is to set the strategic direction 
And we want to ensure we create an environment where innovation can thrive. So innovation and the language of ideas are central to the local industrial strategy, which is available online. Please download and enjoy. A focus of that strategy is commercialization of ideas. And our area, as I've shown before, is very strong in this. It is a place where innovators and markets come together to enable ideas and inventions to be tested, enhanced, commercialized and spun up into high growth ventures. We also have an economic recovery strategy launched last year, which aims to ensure that R&D investment and the innovative nature of local businesses doesn't become a casualty of the pandemic. We looked to government analysis that suggested that R&D investment has a very strong multiplier effect on our economy. And by working jointly between SEMLEP, local authorities, other partners in the wider ARC, the, the ARC Universities Group, um, it's quite a long list, which I'll forget some of, but this area of the country can play a critical role in realising the multiplier effect to support the economy of the entire country. Um, and our backs are all against that wheel to push it. We really want to ensure that this region continues to be at the forefront of the clean growth grand challenge. And I'm wearing my UN development goals badge to remind myself to say that today. And we have a focus here on low carbon aviation, low carbon logistics, sustainable food and drink production and renewable energies. We want to continue to be at the forefront of the Grand Mobility Challenge and support locally led development of facilities and test beds that can pilot and prove those concepts and link them to wider residential and commercial growth. We're building places here, not just machines. We work with our other local partners to expand the innovation capabilities, sustainability and productivity of the local logistics and manufacturing sectors, which are very important. You've only got to drive up the M1, A1, A6 or A14 to know how important logistics is to this area. Um, I've lived in every part of the Semlep region and I remember DERFT being started. That is having a dramatic effect on the entire country. We support transformative green growth across the arc and the other sectors above, but we also look at space and the creative sectors and creative digital. We're looking at future energy and to some broader sectors. We are aiming to have a green growth. We do not wish to sacrifice the planet to make profits. We support innovation across the arc in life sciences, and that's really come as a surprise, uh, not known before, but we are receiving many, many inquiries from global life sciences companies to set up local and national centers in this region. And we really want to build the resilience so that no future public health crisis catches us quite unprepared. Innovation is a team sport. Value is created by collaborating larger regional networks consistently outperform averages and emerging technopoles are probably the way to win on a global level. One of the great opportunities we have is the development of the Oxford Cambridge Arc, which is this lovely diagram here, um, as an area of global potential. And for those reading the papers, 760 million pounds of railway line is going to help join this up to give a spine to our heart and minds in the Oxford Cambridge Arc. The Oxford Cambridge Arc is a global asset and is a national investment priority with determined leadership and financial backing. This arc, which takes in the whole of the Semlet region, can leverage its innovation capability, driving regional, national and global inward investment. And I also sit on the Inward Investment Board trying to attract global companies to set up and grow in our region. Semlet actively supports the larger region and innovation activities across it. This region has all of the attributes that power innovation to greater value. Our area has a high concentration of innovation assets, places, people, skills that can drive it. We have innovation centers. You'll hear from many of them today, and I'm so pleased that some of the speakers to, uh, on the next three days run some of these really great enterprise zones, science parks, technology clusters, university spin-out groups and colleges. 
This contributes to the South East Midlands being recognised as one of the top LEP areas for the percentage of firms engaged in product and service innovation. We didn't need to ask, you were already doing it, and that's very important. About 35% of our businesses have said to us that their future is critically aligned with their innovation success. That actually slightly worries me because I hate to tell you it's 100%. <laughs> So, so the other 65% need to be on this conference. Um, there we go. So how do we help? This region puts time, money and people into supporting innovation. This region through SEMLEP and others has invested funding into capital projects across the region through local growth fund for smaller companies and through the Get It Building Fund for slightly larger ones to ensure we have the assets to enable innovation to, to thrive. There's a couple of little examples that I'll pick on um, a little unfairly because there are lots, but these are the ones I can remember. Marla Powertrain has a real driving emissions center where projects develop new research and development vehicle test chambers. They have altitude and climatic simulation capabilities, which actually I want to go in and try in my outdoor hill walking coat, but I'm not allowed. Um, it's unique in the UK. It's based in Northampton. The project has enabled growth and business growth in the automotive sector, not just for the company, but around it. And it was awarded 2.1 million of local growth fund money to help. At Catesby, the aerodynamic research facility is a 1.7 mile long straight and flat railway tunnel, a really unique asset, now converted to an indoor fully controllable vehicle test facility. It has wind and simulated weather, impact aerodynamics and emissions testing all in one place. It is a significant new global level test facilities and it enhances the whole of the UK vehicle industry and it received 4.2 million of local growth funding. MKU, the Startup to Scale Up programme in Milton Keynes, another city I've lived in and have great affection for, was awarded £2.4 million uh, to create an innovation hub known as the Smart City Living Lab, which provides education and support to scale startup businesses. Milton Keynes has some great accelerators and uh, uh, growth enabling groups, and I'd encourage people to go and look at them. This will focus on smart city technologies, including robotics. It'll look at virtual reality, digital twinning, sensor technology, intelligent infrastructure, autonomous vehicles, which you've probably seen on the news, beetling around Milton Keynes, drones, and some advanced communications technologies. Right, I'm now wrapping up. So we are committed to some more supporting innovation in future. The growth curve part of SEMLEP, which you can find on our website, works with three air universities to provide support for the fastest growing businesses. We work with Cranfield University to deliver peer-to-peer -peer support, and we have grant funding that can help businesses diversify. Finally, our ethos is to deliver connected business support. We are more than 50% business people, not, low, not government people. And we try to keep that business support at the forefront. We're delighted that so many of our support partners are involved in delivering this conference. And with the many sessions and exhibitions, there is an opportunity for everyone here to learn about the support for funding, skills, and knowledge that will help you turn your idea into a commercial reality, turning innovation into value. So my warmest welcome to all of you, our wonderful speakers, to the support team, to the partners who've made this possible, KTN, Innovate, SEMLEP partners who are here, and Julian, who I will now hand back to. I hope you enjoy the day, make new partnerships, find support, and that something in the content today moves your idea from innovation to value. Thank you. Next, uh, I'm really pleased uh, to introduce Stuart Miller. Uh, Stuart is, is my boss at Innovate UK. He's the interim chief technology officer for Innovate UK. Uh, so Stuart, you're going to tell us a bit about the work that our agency is doing uh, to support innovative companies and think about the place agenda as part of the, uh, the new strategy for UKRI and Innovate. Over to you, Stuart. Thank you very much. Thanks, Julian. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Julian says, I'm the CTO, Chief Technology Officer for Innovate UK. Um, I haven't got a huge amount of time this morning, and if I was to give you a full in-depth uh, overview of 
Innovate UK, I would probably be here for two or three hours. So in the time that I've got, I'm just going to try and cover a few of the things that we do. But before I do that, um, just to say that you know the the region, the the um, Southeast Midlands region is obviously a very vibrant region with plenty going on. The work that's been done over the last few years uh, between the, um, the the LEP and ourselves, I think, has started to bear some serious uh, results. And just to put it into context, Innovate UK has invested in about 250 companies in the region over the last five years to the tune of about 130 to 140 million pounds. So the difference between Innovate UK and uh, the LEP is that we have a responsibility on the government's behalf to look at supporting businesses across the whole of the UK. Um, but we do that in a number of different ways. And one of those ways is to have people like Julian focusing on individual regions to make sure that we're understanding the different circumstances in each area and tailoring that support. We have around 600 staff in Innovate UK. Uh, a large number of them are out in the field working closely with people like yourselves um, and trying to make sure that we fulfill our main mission, which is to, um, which is to support businesses in terms of uh, their ability to not just start up, because very often people think that Innovate is all about startup businesses, but it's also about uh, businesses going through different phases of growth. So not only do we support businesses in the startup phase, we also support businesses throughout their life cycle. And we try and do that in a number of different ways, but at the heart of it is understanding how to connect businesses with the things that they need to be successful. And that might involve uh, connections with customers. It might involve connections with investors. It certainly will almost always involve connections with new partners, be they suppliers or, the, or, or um, access to knowledge and information or skills that the, uh, the business doesn't have and needs in order to successfully grow. So at the heart of what we try and do is to break down the barriers for businesses that normal economic circumstances may not do. Um, one of the things that you could think about Innovate UK is doing is taking on some of the risks that uh, other investors might not see as uh, worth investing in. And we have a really proud track record over many years of helping UK businesses um, grow and be successful uh, as the seed that has managed to overcome those issues to then see those businesses taken on by other investors and grow to be very successful. So that along with um, the local enterprise partnership and some of our other partners like KTN allows us to help businesses grow and succeed, not just in this region, but across the UK. But in this region in particular, um, we've been applying those techniques. And one quick example is WG, WJ Group, um, who are involved in providing highway markings. Um, we've helped them connect up through our knowledge transfer partnership with the Open University. And through that, they're looking at two main areas of what they do. One, safety and making sure that uh, when they're lining the roads to make sure that we're all safe, their workforce are safe and that they can apply um, the, the processes that they need to onto the roads in a safe way. Way, but also looking at the chemicals and the chemical compounds that they're using to ensure the environmental integrity of those as well. So that's one very, very small example of what we're doing. Um, I'm sure if you haven't already engaged with Innovate UK, um, you've probably heard about us. And I would really encourage um, everyone who's involved over the next three days, if you haven't uh, approached Innovate UK for support, please don't be shy um, and come and talk to us about your individual needs and what you might require in order to make your businesses successful. I'm just going to digress briefly now, talk about something that's impacted us all over the last uh, almost 12 months now, which is COVID. Two aspects to this. Um, you can read, your, read the slide as I'm talking, lots of numbers on there, lots of information. But overall, what this represents is roughly a £750 million pounds uh, investment on behalf of the government that Innovate UK has managed over the last 10 or so months. Um, it required us to stand up a team very, very rapidly. 
that we'd be able to um, allow the flow of these of these funds to support companies in many different ways. So we opened up the fast start competition to try and help companies um, to think about things that they could do to support um, to support the fight against COVID. We introduced continuity grants, which helps companies stay afloat during this period of time, and also continuity loans. Um, and we've launched a sustainable Innov innovation fund, uh, which is fairly large, and also a rapid response uh, called the Open Call. And all of those combined have pumped the almost um, all of the 750 million into the economy over the last 10 or so months. And to do that, Innovate has scaled up and has actually processed in that 10, let's call it a year, in that year, more than double our normal amount of applications for support and has managed to uh, fund, um, as I say, more than 700 million, uh, more than we would normally do. And we normally support over a billion a year. So it's a significant effort, and I'm not saying that to blow the trumpets just of all those people that have done that within Innovate UK, but obviously I would like to do that as well. But I'm saying that to, to demonstrate that um, Innovate UK really does try to understand what is uh, required to keep businesses successful and to keep them moving. Um, and to try and make sure that the whole of the UK economy in the area of in innovation is being supported in the way it needs to be. We will continue as the, the COVID um, situation evolves and changes. We will continue to support companies with innovative ideas uh, to try and make sure that we're responding to the various phases of COVID as we go forward. Um, So just returning to, to the core uh, reason why Innovate exists. Um, as I said, what we're there to do is try and help companies, both small and growing, to uh, capitalize on their innovations and grow their businesses in the way they would like to and be successful overall for the UK economy. Um, and to do that, as I mentioned, one of the key elements is trying to ensure that uh, companies have the right talents and skills as they grow and mature and go through different phases with different challenges. It's one thing to have a bright idea in the morning and try and start up your own business. It's another thing to be running a multinational uh, company with thousands of employees and billions of pounds of turnover. Not necessarily the same individuals with the same skills can do that. So one of the things that we uh, have rebranded, it used to be known as the European Inter Enterprise Network, and some of you may be familiar with that. Now that we're no longer in Europe, it's now named the Innovate UK Edge program. And that's very much targeted at giving your businesses access to training and skills support um, to allow you to make those transitions that I've just mentioned. So for example, if you feel you are lacking in uh, commercial acumen or legal understanding, then talking to Innovate UK Edge would allow you to then access either temporarily to get you over an, uh, an issue or uh, in a longer term fashion by introducing some training into your business to allow you to make that, that move and, and uh, achieve that maturity. We also have uh, the Catapult Network, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. If you're not, you should be. Um, it's a major network spread across the UK, as you can see there from the, the dots on the map. Um, and actually it spreads a little bit wider than that. But the, the Catapult Network has been set up over a, over a number of years now and is quite mature in a number of areas, but we're all, always looking to see which areas of the economy would benefit from a Catapult type approach. And increasingly, just over the last year or two, the, the issue of leveling up and place is becoming very important for the government. And so we're looking at where these Catapults are operating and where they can make a difference um, and if you need to know more about the Catapult Network, you can find that on our website, but you can also uh, just ask myself or Julian um, and we'll put you in touch. But that is that is a massive resource that the, the country, the UK, has invested in over many years um, and is one that I would really encourage you to use. If you're involved in manufacturing, the high value manufacturing, Catapult with its uh, Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre, 
and the MTC in Coventry, etc., are all well worth getting to know um, because there are huge investments that have gone in there over the years to build up those capabilities. And then uh, just hiding in the background a little bit there is the KTN. And the KTN is a knowledge transfer network who are involved with ourselves in the lab today, trying to, uh, to well, over the next few days as well, putting together this, uh, this conference. And the KTN has been part of Innovate UK for a long time now, and really does help businesses connect with each other and do the kind of things that we're doing today, which is spread the word, raise awareness, and ensure that uh, people know where to go to get the kind of support that they need. There's a change coming um, for Innovate UK. We've been working over the last few years, uh, sorry, over the last few months um, to try and understand how we can deliver what we've successfully delivered in the past in an even better way. Um, and what you're seeing here is a summary slide of uh, the main elements of the Innovate UK strategy, which we will publish fairly, fairly soon. Uh, certainly, I would hope in the next two to three months. Um, but you can see here, and I just thought I'd give you early visibility of the main areas. So we are we are looking to improve and develop Innovate UK's um, strengths in understanding what the future economy might look like, and therefore driving the direction of investment and understanding what kind of businesses to support. Uh, we recognize the issue of growth at scale, the valley of death as businesses get to a certain size and then statistically find it difficult to overcome the barriers to get bigger and, and grow at real scale. Um, and more companies than not struggle at, at a certain level of around the 20 million turnover level um, for all kinds of various reasons. And we want to concentrate on trying to make sure that the success rate beyond that size uh, improves and that the UK economy benefits as a result. We want to encourage more global thinking and more investment, both in companies that want to expand into the global marketplace, but also uh, inward investment from uh, non-UK based uh, sources of finance and ideas into the UK. So we want to build the UK to be uh, a very attractive place to come and innovate. Um, continue to build the ecosystem um, and make those kind of connections that I've mentioned. There is real power in making those connections and that's that's one of the areas that we want to continue to be successful in doing. Um, and increasingly, we'd like to get other government departments involved in what we do, both as potential first customers for new ideas and new technologies, but also to be able to explain to them the benefits of things like tax breaks and, and uh, incentives, et cetera. And we want to do all of that on strong foundations of understanding how we pull through research, for example, how we make sure that we're not damaging the environment, how we make sure that uh, we're getting diversity and equality and inclusion into the economy and various other uh, foundations as well. Uh, and in, in terms of that, I believe today we have um, a couple of people uh, dialed in who we've supported um, through various programs, including uh, our Young Innovators Program and our Women in Innovation Program. So if they're online, welcome to you. And uh, I hope we can do that for more people in the future. Just to, uh, to sort of, oop, gone one slide too far. Sorry, the slides have just clicked on a couple of extra extra ones. But just to sum up, uh, what I was going to say was um, we continue to see the this region as a very vibrant region and look to make sure that we support you uh, and others uh, involved in innovation and business growth in the region over the next few years. Um, we think uh, from the statistics we've seen and some analysis has been done, that this region is well placed for recovery uh, off the back of COVID. And I think, you know, from my point of view and my experience, you should be, uh, both with the university links that you have and the uh, technology parks, et cetera, and the very vibrant community that seems to be in the area. 
So I said I wasn't going to talk too much about funding, but if you do want funding, and of course funding is incredibly important for all businesses, then if you haven't already looked at our, the UKRI website uh, and fun, found the funding finder, then I would encourage you to do that as well. Um, that's where you can uh, start to see the kinds of funding that are available and how to go about applying. Um, but please don't go away with the impression that we're just about giving grants and loans. Um, we are very much about trying to help your businesses be successful uh, by getting very close to what you're trying to do and helping you in many other ways, which hopefully you've picked up from what I've just said in the last 10 or 15 minutes. And with that, I will hand it back to Julian. Great. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, really good overview of what we get up to at Innovate UK. I mean, one of the things I've been working for Innovate for three years, and, and one of the things that I think has been really good has been that uh, move away from you know, we're the nice people who give you free money to actually we understand what your business requirements are. And sometimes uh, that's not cash alone. What that is, is that ongoing support and that critical friendship and the connectivity and networking uh, that can really drive innovation too. Not that we don't give out, as you say, very, quite large sums of money, but nevertheless, uh, we are a lot more than that nowadays, which is great, uh, along with our partners in KTN and Innovate Edge and the Catapult. The other thing, of course, is the way in which place has become even more important. And obviously, as a regional manager, uh, that's good news for me. Um, Jazz asked a question uh, about uh, how do we provide details to connect with Innovate UK? Um, hopefully, Jazz, we've answered that in the course uh, of the presentation. But if not, then uh, let's continue that uh, with you after the next presentation from Ros. Thanks again, Stuart. Uh, so, uh, next speaker uh, is uh, Ros Bird. Uh, Ros is the Commercial Director for um, Silverstone Technology Park and also Chair of the Silverstone Tech Cluster. Um, I'm just really proud that uh, I'm, I'm not a petrol head, I'd freely admit. Some of my colleagues are, uh, but I'm not. But I was really proud um, to discover what was going on at Silverstone, that uh, it's more than just uh, a racetrack, but uh, there's a great deal of other things going on, whether that's connected to the automotive, but increasingly to advanced manufacturing and advanced um, design engineering as well. So uh, I'm really pleased that Ros has agreed to speak today. Uh, over to you, Ros. Thank you very much, Julian. And um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about what we're doing at Silverstone and in the Silverstone Technology Cluster. Um, and, you know, I've, wanted to say as in response to sort of Stuart's presentation that I'm really looking forward to continuing to work with Innovate UK obviously with you Julian and um, I think there's more that we can do I think there always is actually perhaps that's one of the things that that drives me and my motivation is I can see so many opportunities coming out of every meeting event and, and conversation really um, so what I'm going to do in the next sort of 15 minutes that I've been allocated uh, and Julian's asked me to talk about what we're doing in this area in terms of our innovation journey uh, for Silverstone Park and, and Silverstone Technology Cluster. What, I'll tell you a bit about what's worked well to get those businesses working together and as Stuart said, getting those connections going, and that's bearing fruit. And I'll also talk about how we're attracting uh, investment, um, both from uh, the UK and overseas. Um, and I think what I'd say is that my presentation is practical um, advice and examples. There is lots of theory um, behind it, lots of thinking um, and, and a few years of planning in some of it and lots of learning from, from other places in the country, uh, the cluster in Cambridge, for example. Uh, I'm not going to cover that today, but I am more than happy to talk to people uh, separately and also to provide references and links to things that have inspired me in the work that, that we're doing um, at Silverstone that, that might help you if, if you'd like to unpick some of the things that are going on and see how they might work for you. <clears throat> so um, I work for MEPC, that's the logo on the bottom right of the screen. Um, we are uh, basically um, representatives of long-term patient capital, the pension fund money, looking to invest that pension fund money in, in real estate. So that's the sort of basics of why we're in the area at all. 
Um, but the, the, the key thing is about the, the long term thinking, really. Um, and, and, and that means that you're always looking at um, the next sort of 5, 10, 15 years ahead um, when you're getting involved in these things. And I think that's been helpful to us because, um, you know, there are some quick wins and some easy things to do, but also we're, we're always thinking ahead and planning for the future. Right. OK, so, yeah, we bought the land around the track um, at, at Silverstone at the circuit. Um, and we bought it in uh, a many, seven, eight years ago now uh, on the basis that it was a great name, um, central location in the country. And it had some companies there already in, in some of the sort of third party space around the track sides and companies involved in, in engineering, uh, mainly motorsport. And it had significant planning consent over, over 2 million square feet. So I became a uh, state director. Before that, I'd worked for MEPC at Grant Park in Cambridge, involved in all the networking. And, and, and I'm from East Anglia um, and I've come over uh, with a fresh pair of eyes to Silverstone um, with, with no idea um, what the companies would be doing and really to be um, happy to do something different and not necessarily high tech. So not being a petrol head either myself, uh, had to learn about motorsport and that was great really to come in and do the research with the companies on site and find that although they do a lot of work in motorsport as a part of the supply chain very proud of that work also looking to, to apply those skills to other sectors and that was um, already happening with with automotive and, and medical devices at that time um, and then thinking about the two million square feet planning consent, I was thinking, where are the companies now that are going to come over the years to Silverstone Park? And what might they be interested in? So we did uh, a lot of research looking at sort of one hour drive time radius from the park and thinking about um, what, you know, what are those companies doing and um, what do they need in the future? And found many, many more companies like the ones that we have a sort of microcosm of at the time on Silverstone Park. Um, and I would say, again, uh, some motorsport, but going into other sectors, um, but you would say that they were advanced engineering, electronics and software development companies, there's about 4,000 of them in the area. There we go. So here's some of the companies that are, that are on the park, and as you can see, some of those you'll recognise as being uh, motorsport companies. Um, but like I say, um, looking for opportunities to transfer that know-how into other sectors and um, successfully doing that now, by the way, in, in automotive, as you know, with the uh, battery technology, uh, defence, aerospace and, and, and things like medical uh, devices. Um, but the thing that um, we noticed that wasn't um, kind of there at the time when we bought in and, and got involved with those companies started talking to them was there wasn't really much sense of community and there certainly weren't many opportunities for those companies to make new connections so they, lots of people knew each other um, so we wanted to, to, to sort of on the park think how could we help these companies to look for new business opportunities look to collaborate with each other and we started to organize networking events to help them to get to know each other, develop that understanding and encourage that sense of community. And that is part of MEPC's thinking on all the parks. So Granta Park, no different. Milton Park in Oxford, the same. Um, and also um, my background prior to MEPC was working for the UK Science Park Association. So looking at good practice in helping companies to, to meet that serendipitous meeting and chance conversation that sparks an idea and helps to solve a problem later down the line and getting the big companies that are well established working with the small companies and the individuals to inspire each other is what it's all about so developing that business community on site and developing lots of business networking opportunities and the, the other thing that we did at the same time was look at ways to develop this community of mutual regard one of the things that all the companies would say is an issue for them is skills how to attract and retain the best people um, if you're in technology, you need some specialists and, you know, you'll compete with uh, companies overseas as well to attract those people. So we set up a sports and social programme, again, similar to, to what I did at Grant Park before that's gone down really well. Um, everything from five-a-side football to quiz nights and anything in between. And, and again, that just helps to create that environment that is... Um, attractive to um, employees. Um, so that's part of developing a community is developing um, the connections between individuals and feeling a, 
a sense of being part of that community. And then at the same time, um, I worked initially with Barclays and then with the others that you can see uh, along the bottom of your screen, it, screen there in terms of the local companies, Barclays and EMW and the likes, to fund SQW to do a piece of research because I had a hunch based on what we did in Cambridge that um, there was really a, a high tech cluster here uh, in this area that needs to, needed to be sort of um, promoted and supported. Uh, so SQ, I asked SUW to reveal the cluster and they were much more skeptical and said, well, we'll wait and see, run our tests, ask the questions, go out and do the research. And over about a six to eight month period, they got really excited about the fact that this isn't just co-location of companies, that companies have to be in the area to do what they do. And so we published a report and um, we, we knew that companies would say to us, the ones in the local area, great, well, thanks for confirming what we already knew in terms of the skills pool and our capabilities and the knowledge that we have and the reasons that we're in the area, but what's in it for us? And that's why we set up Silverstone Technology Cluster based firmly on um, the experience I had of Cambridge Network, Cambridge Wireless, um, um, One Nucleus in Cambridge and set up this high tech cluster organization that with a website, a chief executive with a presentation under his arm a board um, that includes business um, uh, representatives and the founder members and Kieran and Salter that you're going to hear from later were, inspired me, um, you know, to, to get this done and to work with the business community. And he's he's been a, 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 a you know supporter and board member uh, for a number of years uh, for Silverstone Technology Cluster. You'll you'll hear his presentation later. So um, what we do is we um, promote the capabilities of the companies. We give a, a phone number out there to the world to ring if you're interested in engaging the skills, advanced engineering, electronics and software of, of these businesses. Um, we're looking at how to support these companies to grow. That's the support side. And also, crucially, giving them a place to come together and talk about cutting edge technology. And that's the special interest groups that we organise. Um, so now if I just move on to, that's the sort of background of what we've done. And then the things that have worked really well, um, sometimes you'd say this is sort of simple stuff, but um, this is this is the sort of how-to guide from me of, of, of how to get the community going. And doing things like having senior team lunches where you just get six or eight guests around the table and you give them a sit down meal and a chance to talk, everybody gets the chance to give an update on what they're working on, share ideas, have a discussion, with the door closed, two hours in a relaxed environment. That's worked so well, and, and, it, and I started that when I was over in Cambridge. And sometimes there's a theme, and sometimes it's a real eclectic mix, but the point is you're developing that sense of mutual regard and inspiring people. Um, you know, everyone's working hard in their own way on their projects and having similar issues sometimes with staff retention or, you know, um, refuse collection can be as, as, as uh, practical as that. And then another thing that's worked well is getting speakers in for a couple of hours in the evening and hosting that with um, networking and that attracts a, a, a wider audience. And then something that's been really important um, is to have a metrology facility on site. And this is something that, um, again, has come from the learning from when I was at Grant Apart working with uh, looking at the work that Babram Institute was doing at the time where they had a kind of rent a lab um, facility so SMEs and individuals could access those facilities for a few weeks, a few hours, longer term maybe, um, but give them the chance to, to get some innovation done. And so um, with this metrology facility, this is something that's in the Innovation Centre at Silverstone. We work in partnership with Hexagon. Hexagon have provided the facility. It's the the latest equipment in metrology, which anyone involved in making things um, requires time to time. But it's the sort of kit that um, an individual or a, a growing company probably couldn't afford to buy or rather not buy um, because they want to invest in staff and, and, and other things. So it's giving them access to these crucial bits of kit at the right moment um, uh, to, to do that sort of uh, professional work on their products and services and the checking that they need to do. And that's been um, fantastic for us and for some of the businesses give them a real leg up. And, an, and another practical project that's worked really well is listening to the company saying we're concerned about the skills pool, keeping it fresh, you know, encouraging young people to think about engineering as a career. 
So we've worked with the local schools and a company called Dyer Innovation, a woman called Julia Muir, who does a lot of work with schools around the country. She set up the Automotive 30% Club. And she's worked with us to engage with local secondary schools and um, uh, train our uh, business volunteers from all the companies on the park and, and developing that relationship. So managing the relationship between the businesses that really want to get the message out about you know, what they're working on and the sorts of young people they're looking for and the young people that really desperately need information about opportunities and careers in the local area. So we've had, we, we do both with, with the schools every year, it's the third or fourth year now that we're in. We go into the schools and talk to them for a day and in assemblies and in workshops in particular subject areas. And then we also get them out to us to really see those environments and, and understand what it's all about, hopefully inspire them to um, do their best. And the message always is it's about the right attitude, really. Um, that's what um, businesses are looking for. Let's just try and move on. OK, yeah, so this this slide here uh, on another um, sort of thing that's worked very well for us with Silverstone Technology Cluster, other special interest groups. These are the ones that, that we have at the moment. How they work is that um, Pim Van Barsen, the CEO of STC, he works closely with Cambridge Wireless to make sure we set these up correctly. There's a knack and a way of doing it. You have a committee of business representatives that lead the group and the subject matter that they're going to look at over two or three meetings in a year. And then there'll be leading edge technical thinking and discussion going on in those forums. We get very good feedback about those. They help to promote um, the specialisms of the area. They help to bring new people in and they help our businesses to um, you know, keep up with the latest and gives them a platform to talk about the specialist work that they're doing. And also having an annual conference has been really good for us to engage with ministers and MPs to bring you know, te te technological presentations in and really mix it up as a bit of a crucible or melting pot of, of ideas for a day and, and really just inspire the whole community and see the benefit of being part of that community and all the different activities going on and we missed that this year uh, last year with with obviously the pandemic we're really hoping we can get back in a room together i don't think we'll need to do all of our events and events in a room together but this this annual uh, event has been a really good for us and then uh, the another thing to talk about is uh the gender equality and diversity committee we've set up now this is part of our business growth agenda talking to businesses about, you know, questioning, are they fit for purpose to attract and retain all the best people? 51% of the population are women. So if you haven't got circa 50% women um, working for you, then there's some barriers to them joining and you're probably missing some great creativity, innovation, problem solving, the right people, the right attitude. And then in the last few minutes that I've got, if I just mention, you know, quite simply, how do we attract? Uh, there's several several things. Um, one is obviously having a very good website because that works while you're sleeping. Um, so you know, making sure that we're keeping that up to date and current and and really clear about um, all of the things that are going on in the community and the activities that people can link with, join in with, and and get involved and benefit from. And then also um, having events, um, sponsoring events. Um, things like the Advanced Engineering Show being the uh, sponsor of the uh, VIP lounge and getting in there and just meeting with lots of people and, and letting them know what we're doing. And then another thing that works really well is hosting uh, industry leading events at the park. And especially we every year have hosted the embassy reps uh, from DIT and put on, you know, a whole day of presentations, giving that full range of expertise and talking um, with individuals about the opportunities for them to engage with the community uh, it, around Silverstone. And then I think finally, and something Julian alluded to earlier, was having the right accommodation um, uh, for, for businesses. So this is the latest scheme that we completed at Christmas and it's 70% let on completion, despite the pandemic and everything else that's going on. Um, and, uh, and we're now considering the next phase. And we, we, we stay very close to understanding what our customers are looking for before we design and build um, the, the, these, these buildings. And we've got two million square feet and you know, we've, we've got the opportunity to speculatively build because of the long-term investment there. Um, so I'll be getting on with getting some more planning consent this year, as well as hopefully 
looking forward to the next scheme and letting the remaining units. And, and one of the things that's happened over the course of the last um, two or three years is the attraction of specialist facilities to Silverstone Park. So I mentioned the metrology facility. Uh, you talked about the Catesby Tunnel that Total Sim Rob Lewis has set up. He's also got the sports engineering hub, which is sort of aerodynamic work for elite athletes. That's at Silverstone. 3C Test has got its anechoic chambers doing electromagnetic testing with everything from automotive to you know, bits of kit that go into theatre of war and everything in between. And I think Kieran's going to talk about the latest that's moving to site, which is being fitted out at the moment, the Digital Manufacturing Centre. And there are there will be more to announce that, that are coming as well over the coming months. And I think that the key for that is to get the message out there to, to the whole of the UK manufacturing and overseas that these facilities are available and we want companies to come in and look at how they can use them to improve productivity, to help with recovery, you know, to, to take them into the 21st century and some of their processes. And um, we're really keen to do as much as we can to promote these facilities over the, the coming months. And finally, um, STC is now the a Be The Business Trailblazer project for the UK. And I think that is, is, is helping to put the cluster region on the map. Uh, as an area of economic growth and it's also obviously offering bespoke business support for the companies um, the companies in the in the cluster that have just got such great potential and I think there's more that we can do and I think um, you know the potential is being unlocked but we're just that's why I'm so keen I think to work with Innovate UK and other government departments over the coming months to explore what more we can do to really support the economic growth of the area. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ros. Um, really great sort of run through of, of uh, all the exciting things that are going on uh, at this at the the park and and within the cluster itself. And um, as you rightly say, it's uh, that really powerful combination of you know you've got the right premises, but it's not just a place. It's not just a technology park. It's actually a community as well, and that's that's just so important as a way of driving, driving innovation and growth. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, have we got an old slide of um, Silverstone up there? It looks like there's a rather more building on the, on the site. So that's that's a pretty old picture on that, isn't it? I think. Yeah, we need to update our aerial photography. Get it out there. <laughs> Next time a satellite goes over, we'll have to commission a photo. Um, okay, we, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. Um, please do please do keep them coming in. Um, the first question, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, is Vicky online? Or you're all set? Brilliant. Okay. First question uh, is for you, Vicky, uh, in David's absence. Uh, you know, what do you think, are, and, and I'll probably broaden it out because it feels like it's a question that both Stuart and Ros will have a view on. What are the key skill requirements to support R and D, and and how are we working both locally and nationally to uh, upskill the workforce? Vicky, have you got any thoughts from a LEP perspective? Yeah, so I think on the first side of it, I think in terms of the key skills requirements, I think one of the ones that sort of always strikes me is that sort of commitment to lifelong learning. Um, you know, and actually, it's you know when you meet, it's the companies that you meet who've got that openness to explore new ideas, to learn from others, um, and to kind of expand their horizons, that I think is really key. Um, and I think Ros has already mentioned it, but that openness to collaboration as well, you know, recognising actually you don't have to have all the answers yourself, but actually it's it's kind of taking what you've got and then, and then collaborating with others. So, you know, things like the special interest groups that Ros mentioned, um, you know, one of the things we've seen recently is the value of that peer networking. We're running a programme at the moment with Cranfield University around peer networks and bringing small groups of businesses together um, and just learning from others on their journey, I think, is a really important part of that, that requirement. I mean, you know, there's a recognition as well, I think, that there's a range of skills required. You know, it's not just about the sort of technical skills to develop the particular thing that you're wanting to, you know, the particular product or whatever, but it's, you know, it's the commercial aspect. It's the getting the product to market. Um, you know, the, the market research that comes with that. And I think, you know, it's important to recognise you don't necessarily have to have all those skills in, you know, at, as the owner manager yourself, but it's about, you know, bringing the right people around you 
Um, and I, I suppose I just encourage there are lots of resources out there. Um, you know, I think that's the whole purpose of this conference, isn't it? To showcase actually, there are lots of places you can go to kind of get those skills. Um, I mean, one, one of, we'll hear from University of Bedfordshire af after the break, but um, you know, one of the things they've got is, um, is a project that funds sort of up to 20 hours of academic expertise where you can actually access expertise from an academic and that that's you know a way that you can kind of access that that skills resource in terms of upskilling the workforce it's an incredibly um important part of what we do as a lep and in, an incredibly sort of valuable part um you know something we value very highly um and we've got a session on it on on thursday in terms of a you know a, a one of the sessions for the conference is all around the skills side so um you know there'll be lots more detail shared there but um you know, we work very closely with with our universities as well as our colleges and with employers to ensure that, you know, that the sort of future talent pipeline is is relevant to what businesses need. So, you know, it's partly about looking at that long term view. But then in the short term, there are lots of, you know, there are projects out there that can fund that upskilling of workforce. So uh, as an example, you know, one that we often refer businesses to is is a project that's European funded called Skills for the, the Workforce, which can actually provide funded support to upskill, um, you know, ups, upskill employees within within companies in a, in a variety of, of areas. But, um, you know, it's an area that we we recognise, as, as I think Ross said as well, you know, that, that uh, skills is a really important part. We know there are gaps and I think there's more that we we need to continue to do to understand what those gaps are and, and look at how we can, can meet those gaps. Great. Thanks, Vicky. And, and thanks for uh, doing a flyer for the session on skills. Uh, this time on Thursday morning, um, please do join us if you if you're interested in skills. Ros, do you have any any perspective on on skills and the work you're doing uh, on uh, within the, the cluster on skills? Yeah, definitely. I'd say there's two target audiences, which are you know school leavers or when they're choosing their GCSEs or or, or you know um, further education. We need to communicate with them well and also people that will be retraining as a result of um, the pandemic and needing to, um, you know, wanting a job in another sector. And I think that um, what the businesses always say um, to me is if, if somebody wants to go into any of those specialisms, they need to start with a general engineering qualification at any level. And then from there, they can start specialising. So we need to think about, do we have FE and HE provision in our area that's fit for purpose and up to date and how, how can the business community feed into that. So I think that's that's really simple stuff. It's those two groups and it's general engineering if you're interested in our, in our you know, as a start as a starter. And then with the businesses themselves, um, it, you know, you've got to recognize that you've got introverts and extroverts, you know, working in the business community. And the introverts find it harder to say what they're doing and to stand on a platform or to talk at a networking event. So it's, it's encouraging all of these uh, innovators to, and giving them the opportunity to talk and share. Because if people keep quiet about what they're doing or feel like, you know, maybe it's not their day to speak up, you could really miss opportunities. So I think as a Innovate UK and SEMLEP and, and for us, always trying to create different environments in which the whole range of different business people get the chance to talk and share and listen and think about how they can collaborate. Um, and, and I would say the, the other key thing is um, our business community are, are trying to get the message out there, especially to young people, that it is not about getting A's and going to Oxford or Cambridge. It's about the right attitude. So as long as you have the right attitude and you're working your hardest and doing your best, they're the sorts of people that they want working for their for their business and in actual fact some of the companies would really rather people didn't have loads of qualifications think they know how to run a machine because they'd quite like to train them in their way of doing it which um, may be more useful for our market. So. Thanks Ross I don't know whether I'm reassured uh, by that I'm pleased my daughter's not listening about it. you don't have to have A's it's well, obviously, I do say to young people, you know, if you can get A's, if that's your best, well, that's marvellous. That's great. Go for it. But yeah, not everyone can. The yeah, majority I... don't manage quite that, but they're the ones running all the businesses in Silverstone. 
Probably, yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> Quite right. Just my own personal obsession, as you can tell, the joys of homeschooling. Stuart, I, I know um, skills is, is a, an important part of our agenda now. Is there anything from an innovate perspective that you'd want to add to the issue of, of skills and uh, skill shortages? I would just echo a lot of what uh, Vicky and Rose have just said, and maybe add one or two things. So I think, firstly, the word skills is, can mean a lot of different things. Um, sometimes it means you know having skills as an apprentice or skills as an engineer or whatever and other times it means business skills i think for anybody over the last few months um when we've been consulting and talking to people about what's missing in the innovate landscape in the uk when we got onto the subject of talent and skills what's missing is to some extent what ross talked about which seems to be that business knowledge and the acumen that's required to grow your business um, which isn't necessarily taught at school and um, not always taught on uh, business management courses in universities either so uh, I would say one of the things not to uh, to, to really value and, and promote is coaching and mentoring we have a huge um, library of people who have got experience of building businesses seeing businesses fail, working in different parts of businesses, who can help uh, younger people who are starting up, people who haven't got that level of experience. And I don't think we use that anywhere near as much as we should do. Um, and it would be good to figure out a way to, to actively encourage people involved in vibrant businesses, maybe later, as they get into later in the careers, to carve out the time to spend with smaller, younger businesses. Um, because that's a huge resource that we've got in the UK that we've built up over time. Thanks, Stuart. Um, if you stay on, there's a, a question for you, which I'll then put around to the rest of the panel. Um, uh, it's from Richard. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Stuart, in your presentation, that more UK companies struggle to back 20 million turnover. Does that mean Innovate UK support focus is changing from high growth startups to bigger companies? So where, where are we, you know, where, where's our focus at the moment? Well, we're probably better known for the support to lots and lots of companies that are trying to get started. Because as I said in the presentation, we tend to take more risk um, and we tend to give grants rather than make investments. So the big difference with Innovate is that, you know, the money, most of the money that companies get from us, we don't ask to get it back where a VC might or will. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're well known, I think, out there for helping startups and small businesses, but not so well known for the fact that right now we, and for many years, we have supported major businesses in the UK. We spend a lot of money supporting some of the biggest well-known businesses in, in the UK, like Rolls-Royce, uh, BA Systems, um, Boeing, Airbus. Um, so we do both right now. I think what, uh, what I was trying to portray in the presentation was the strategic work that we've done um, has pointed to the fact that across the various sectors, um, it is very difficult for companies to, to get to a certain level of growth where they've had that initial support and they've got themselves to the point where they've maybe got you know, 20, 30 staff and they've got a product and they're starting to go to market, but now they've got to ramp up. They have to get into full production. They have to have they have to understand processes and they have to meet various standards and they have to be worrying about supply chains and they have to be worrying about modern slavery and they have to be worrying about all kinds of things that they have to do, um, as well as the money, as well as the product, as well as the market and the customers. And that's where a lot of companies start to fail because the coming back to the point that was made earlier about talent and skills. It's a unique, very few and fairly unique individuals who have that combination of technical understanding of the technology and product that they want to build the business around, the ability to then build that business and understand finance, legal, commercial, production, uh, you know, customer relations, and everything else that goes with that to lead a business through all those different stages. So, what I'm really trying to say is that. Um, we, we do support companies of all different sizes right now. I think in the future, as well as what we're doing right now, we're going to additionally focus on 
how do we help those companies that are in that mid stage um, and how do we help them become the global companies or the large companies in the UK in the future? Thanks, Stuart. Um, Vicky, do you want to do a similar run through of uh, you know, what, if any, the, the LEPS priorities are in terms of business support? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it, it, it's interesting. So I think we've debated it quite a bit in the past 12 months, because clearly with the pandemic and kind of having to sort of shift to survival um, and, and sort of focusing on survival, it, it probably has sort of slightly changed our focus. Um, but certainly, you know, I think our focus or, our, you know, what we've identified is, is those kind of scale up companies and sort of the companies who've got that potential to scale, you know, are, are a real opportunity area for us. And so a lot of our support is, is kind of designed around, around that section of, of, of businesses, which we sort of roughly define sort of from anything from kind of sort of half, you know, 200k, half a million up, to, up you know, kind of up to probably sort of uh, the 20 million mark. Um, now that's absolutely not to say we don't support businesses that are smaller than that or bigger than that. Um, it's just that you know we, we, our experience tells us that that's that kind of stage as Stuart was referring to, where they're having to kind of grow from that kind of you know small kind of three to five man company to take on some of those bigger challenges in terms of of what it you know what what it kind of means to kind of have a bigger company and have to have some of those processes in place and and take on um, you know some of the challenges around that. I mean, the other thing, you know, we, we've got about 75,000 businesses in our region. Um, and what, what's quite interesting is to kind of look at where the bulk of the, the business population sits within, within that kind of sort of size, if you like. Um, and actually, when we sort of get to that sort of, you know, sort of over sort of 10 million, certainly over 50 million, it's actually quite a small percentage of businesses. However, what we do recognise is that, you know, there are a lot of large employers in, in that category. So, you know, one of the things we've done this year is actually had a more had more focus on how do we sort of build that relationship with some of our key companies how do we sort of um you know ensure that we can understand what their needs are that we can kind of retain them in the area and that's a real um you know that's really valuable to us so it's a bit of a broad mix but i think we uh, you know we recognize actually sort of some of those high growth companies who are sort of scaling to that next stage is, is an area that we sort of particularly uh, focus on Right. Thanks, Vicky. And, and Roz, any thoughts from you on, on this question of where to, where to put our focus? Yeah, I think the, the answer is that um, you need a full range of sizes of businesses and also at the different stages, because you can have a mature company that's small. You know, having employing lots of people doesn't mean um, success or, um, or uh, that you, you're, um, you know, mature business so depends on what you're what you're doing so for us at Silverstone we, we've we've always made sure that we've created a full range of space from hot desk facilities and you know a casual workspace and flexible offices small flexible workshops through to larger standalone um, buildings and we've got the capabilities of building you know massive facilities for for large businesses that want to be located with all, all of that activity so it's it, for, for me, I would say it's very important in our region that we look after each um, of, of these different types of need from, you know, people starting up a business, um, young companies through to the, to the more mature ones. Um, and actually, they all need the same thing. They need, to, they need to communicate well about what they're doing, be open to collaboration, ge genuinely be good at the skills they're saying that they have to offer the market. And, and they all want to be, you know, in a place that will impress clients, motivate staff. So um, I've never found, and, and actually, you know, you could be talking about haulage businesses, fast moving consumer goods, you know, there's some basics there that businesses need in terms of accommodation support um, and, and, you know, support to communicate their, their skills. So we do work with the full range and um, I guess private sector means that, um, haven't been given any targets so it's just really a case of what's needed and 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 who's who's picking up and, and interested in working with us and benefiting from what we do great thanks so i mean the message really I, I think from all the three speakers is we're here to support any company that's ambition that ambitious and that wants to grow um uh, there's another question for you um just for you, Ros, um, throw from John. 
do you look at other motorsport hubs globally? And I'm, I'm not sure whether this is a place question. And are there any other facilities like STC? Okay, right. So they look at us generally would be the short answer. Um, from China to Australia to the US, um, it's a successful uh, motor racing circuit, as you know, um, with the Grand Prix and MotoGP and goodness knows what. So it's firmly on the map with the whole motorsport community globally. And um, that means that there's often a, a number of uh, similar organizations to the MEPC organization across the world saying, gosh, how did they do that? That looks really good. They've got businesses around that circuit and it's all flourishing. And so I, I, there are, there are um, you know, uh, famous, other famous racetracks around the world and they are developing um, facilities and some are more mature than others uh, in France and, and Germany um, in Ring and over in, in the US as well. Um, and then um, in terms of facilities like ours, well, if you um, have a look at the UK Science Park Association website, which is bucksbar.org, you'll see there's about 100 different science parks in the UK. That The, the, the number ranges a bit, but uh, associated with um, science parks, um, uh, with universities at, or in a, in a cluster like ours, 13 in Cambridge, um, Surrey Research Park, you name it. And um, in all of these locations, there's people like me wired up to try and think how do we create something that's more than just a industrial estate or business park? How do you create the community? And you know, to a greater or lesser extent, they've been, they've been successful at that and that's ongoing. Um, you've obviously, uh, as, as Stuart was mentioning, that the catapults um, and uh, the research institutes as well and the work they do um, and, and, and universities with specialism. So there's, there's so much in the innovation landscape in the UK to draw from. And um, yeah, so, uh, and, and obviously, as I mentioned, which isn't on any of the um, Oxford Cambridge Art maps, but really should be because it's the engine room of it. Is, is the high tech networks. As I mentioned before, Cambridge Network, Oxford Bio Network, Cambridge Clean Tech, Oxford Bio, you know, um, Green Tech, uh, the, the uh, one nucleus that is the largest uh, cluster of biotech uh, in Europe in Cambridge, and obviously Silverstone Technology Cluster, to name but a few. Um, and and you know, Westcott uh, in our area with the space uh, technology. Um, so um, there's just many, many different. Um, little areas where there's that community of, of activity and um, uh, yeah so there's lots to tap into and I can send links through if people are interested to, to make sense that perhaps that's something Julian we should be doing or Stuart we should be doing for the business communities to map that all on to one one plan and say you know what the specialisms who's the person to call and and mm. try and make sure all those links are there and that awareness is raised. No, I think that's a good point. And, and uh, thank you, Ros. And, and I think it relates to uh, the final question, uh, which is addressed to me. Thank you, Nathan. Um, can you explain the difference between Innovate UK Edge business support services and SEMLET business support services? I mean, my, my reflection um, relates to uh, what Ros was saying at the end. That, uh, you know, we, we know that and government has known for ages uh, that the business support landscape is is very crowded uh, and ideally you know what what we would want to do through innovate is um to offer uh, a the sort of no uh, no wrong door approach so you know if if you come across uh, innovate edge first or if you come across innovate first and ask the question uh, you know i'm not a business advisor but I can hopefully point you in the right direction. Likewise, Innovate Edge, it might be that, yes, we think we can offer the expertise that you, you need and are interested in, but if not, then we can pass you on to the local person who does know. So um, I know uh, Innovate Edge has been moving to being uh, slightly more focused on the existing Innovate customer group, although uh, there are nomination possibilities from LEPS. Uh, uh, and uh, SEMLEP's business advisory services cover all of the business environment of which innovation is a subset. But nevertheless, I mean, the starting point should be, it's what you as a, co a company need and have a conversation, whether it's with, uh, you know, me, Innovate Edge, 
KTN, the Catapult, Semlep. And uh, if we're doing our jobs well, then we'll get you to the right place and we'll provide you with the service you're looking for. It's take up that's the issue more than anything else, Julian, isn't it? It's not the amount of um, different business growth opportunities and support that's available. It's how to reach out to those businesses that really need that support, and get them to take it up. That's that's the golden question, really, how to do that. Yes, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I, I mean, Vicky was saying there are 75,000 businesses um, within the SEMLEP area. At any one time, all the evidence says about 10% of those companies are going through, you know, a growth spurt in some guys, whether it's thinking about exporting or innovating or investing. Um, we need to support those uh, companies, but equally that means there are 70,000 companies uh, that uh, might be in need of our support or advice that we're not getting to. Um, equally, they might say, well, actually I'm getting on and doing my business and I don't need government support agencies. Um, but nevertheless, I think we need to be uh, have a higher profile and make sure that people are aware of us, particularly in this time when when many companies thought you know they were doing great business until a year ago and then they've fallen off a cliff. Um, I thought this morning's discussion was absolutely fascinating, and I'm I'm still sort of reeling, uh, sort of picking up off the floor and giving me smelling salts. So doing the conversation between Roz and Stuart, I thought that was absolutely fascinating. That uh, you know. Uh, uh, um, Perhaps businesses don't always want certain qualifications and uh, that to universities, of course, uh, don't teach all the skills that businesses want. Uh, and of course, we're in the, the business of education and the business of closing that gap. And I think uh, that's very true comments. And I want to hear more about that for, for, from people, perhaps either in my presentation or the Q&A Q or, of course, other workshops uh, uh, throughout the course of, uh, a course of the next few days. Well, very good morning to everyone. I hope you're all very, very well. Um, I'd like to say a few words about uh, the role of the university in stimulating innovation uh, within within a region. Um, he says, trying to find, uh, do I have control? I do have control. Let's have a look. There we go. There we go. We're away. Rock and roll. Um, every university will approach this slightly differently, of course, very much depending on their expertise. Um, their uh, uh, infrastructure, their resources. If I had a Hadron Collider on, on, on site, I'd be operating very, very differently. But I think broadly speaking, the universities try and affect the region, try and support innovation in these broad terms. Uh, many of you, of course, will be aware of our teaching function uh, in terms of supporting our, our undergraduates. And uh, again, I think many of you will be on various industrial panels trying to sort of steer the curriculum to make sure we have those business needs, hence my my, my shock at the earlier comments that perhaps we're not doing that. And that's something we, we can look at. But I think a lot of you won't necessarily be that familiar with our research and knowledge exchange uh, uh, capabilities. Um, and in particular, um, this slide is actually slightly, an older slide actually is taking something off there. There should have been an arrow in between there that looked at the two way interaction. We don't just sit there in our ivory towers. I'm still waiting for my office in the ivory tower. I'm looking forward to that. But it's, it's very much getting a sense of a two way uh, uh, dialogue between us, between support agencies and industries to try and understand about uh, how we should um, uh, uh, steer some of our functions. going to move on. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> we think we've got most of our provision in particular good areas. Um, we did a little bit of work um, uh, probably about a year ago now looking at our impact in the region and um, working with an outside uh, organization and for every pound that the university generate, University of Bedfordshire generates, uh, we have something like 6.5 pounds worth of gross value added in the region. That includes uh, uh, contributing to some of the European support projects, CPD, contract research and so on and so forth. We think we've got a pretty good idea about where the problems are. We don't just structure our provision uh, uh, sort of willy-nilly you know, and sporadically or, or chase the money in terms of funding. We try and understand some of the bigger challenges on a global level, working with, uh, uh, off the top of my head, the, the UN or World Health Organization or the IMF or a European level, 
Uh, many of you would have been aware of some of the discussions about how Britain, since Brexit, shouldn't mention the B word, there's another pound in the, uh, in, in the swear jar, um, uh, how we look at some of our research provision, how we get involved with the European framework, and of course now we are involved, it's not signed off yet, but how we understand some of the global challenges, and at the UK and regional level, working with uh, SEMLEPs, working with U uh, uh, Innovate UK, working with the councils, to try and understand where some of these uh, issues, big challenges are, and how we steer provision. And we have 10 research institutes at the university looking for everything from health research, social care, business management, biomedical, uh, uh, um, environmental research, sports and media and everything in between. How we steer our research provision to generate that expertise. Um, here's a good example. I won't talk too much about this. Uh, um, looking at some of the global challenges, looking at some of the, the needs of regional businesses, we really came to the conclusion a little while ago that perhaps we're not doing enough in some areas. And that led to a discussion between us and uh, TW. Oh, oh, there you go, it's still got the timing on it. Never mind. And, uh, and uh, TWI Limited, an organisation out in Cambridge, many of you will be familiar with, and to create a research centre in house in the organisation to look at renewable energies. Nothing says renewable energies than a bunch of middle-aged people standing around in suits. But, but, but that, 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 that's high hopes for this area. And we recently got our uh, um, latest million pound bid to look at areas of, of uh, uh, renewable energy. Broadly speaking though, it's smaller companies that we work with. I think we work with something like six to 800 SMEs uh, in the region uh, in a variety of different ways. And do please look at our website. We've got a whole variety of case studies to show how we can impact and work with small companies. And indeed, uh, Jenny uh, is one of the uh, one of the companies that we, we uh, companies we work with. Hopefully, Jenny's gonna say lots of nice things about that. I'm looking at Jenny's um, picture now. She's got a bit, a bit of a poker face on. We have no idea what Jenny's going to say, but 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 hopefully, uh, um, Jenny will give you a bit of a bit of an idea of some of the journey that you went through and how you engaged with us and perhaps how, how we supported you and continue to support you uh, in that sort of area. And, and similar to what I said about the, the notion of our research expertise, we don't just sporadically put offering. We can off we, if you call us and uh, see if we can help you. We can almost certainly help you. But that's not a particularly efficient and effective way of me setting up my services and my um, departments in the university. So what we do is we work with the regional agencies, with SEMLEC, with, with Innovate UK, with uh, um, the various councils and so forth, so forth, to look at some of the regional problems, some of the regional deficits that we can help address. I hate to, hate to use the word solutions. It always sounds like you're sort of selling shelving or something like that. But these are some of the solutions that we've put together, whether it's innovation, whether it's getting new expertise into your organizations, whether it's looking at productivity, updating skills, support for innovation. And all these areas that you see there are funded European projects um, that, uh, because we understand the problems of SMEs are not always sort of cash rich at that time. To, to address in a variety of ways, whether it's expertise into businesses, access to facilities, looking at higher, higher level skills or, or whatever, uh, to really address some of your, some of your problems. Where's the little box going? There we go. I'm not gonna to talk too much about this because I think other presentations do go into more depth about some of the projects, but this is an example. Innovation Bridge, I wrote the initial Innovation Bridge about seven years ago now, and it's proved highly successful for SMEs, particularly those looking at innovating products, processes, or services. This is just an example of one of the iterations of the project and some of our goals, which is to start new jobs, to develop new products, and to help in a variety of ways, to help organizations with grants, but also leverage additional funding from elsewhere, as well as help new companies grow, become more productive and indeed start up. We'll get on to skills, perhaps the second area now. And again, in a similar process, we understand some of the international, national, regional, local problems um, when it comes to skills. And we're very hooked into most of those networks, as indeed um, I think many of you uh, will be. And if you look at some of the regional problems, whether it's uh, understanding you know, basic business uh, business skills or particular skills around software development or some of the intercultural business skills. Our aim is to put on a variety of, of, of um, uh, programs to help support you. This is an example of how we've uh, how we've developed a whole range of programs, whether it's the shorter courses such as Lean Six Sigma, Prince Two, Agile. Now you'll see they're largely around productivity, and that's been particularly successful. 
um, uh, all over really, but you can see how the organization's moving past the kind of, we've just got to survive, now thinking about how we're going to tailor our businesses uh, for the coming economic environment in Britain, how that's been, again, particularly successful. And also perhaps more some of the longitudinal high level skills uh, requirements. Um, to use your levy, if you're, a, if you're a levy payer for higher degree apprenticeships, if you're not, of course, if the government pays something like 95%, I can't remember off the top of my head, towards higher degree apprenticeship provision. And you'll see there, uh, and I think I won't go in again too much details, other people will do that, but the range of higher degree apprenticeship training programs that we have, all of these are business led. So it's very much what business are telling us what they need, hence my, my, my um, shock at early discussions, but you know, that is the discussion that we've got to have to make sure we're tailoring our solutions uh, correctly. Dramatic pause while I wait for the slide to move on. There we go. I mean, we think we're quite successful at what we do. Um, when you weight us in terms of size of institution, uh, in terms of higher education institution, we're actually um, in the top 10 uh, in the country for providing CPD to business. And we had a wide range of apprenticeships, as I say, about 120, 130 people on those apprenticeship uh, apprenticeship programs and something like 62 contracts with business uh, uh, um, uh, to, to provide people to, to go on those courses. But it's not just innovation in terms of SMEs. We work very much in the third sector. Uh, and our public and civic engagement is incredibly important to us. Uh, these slides have been changed since I sent them across, and it's much neater now. I can, I can understand what's going on. Fantastic. Well done, whoever did that. Um, these are a range of projects um, that we've been involved with, helping artists, for example, in creatives, or, or helping sustainability projects, or sitting on boards and, ver and various, um, various other projects. And here's just perhaps one example that's been highly successful, and I think has got a lot of media attention over the years, working with the British Red Cross, there was a massive problems with refugees getting the right amount of legal support. So using our undergraduates and graduates, we now provide that service free of charge. And of course, that's a very worthy thing. I think it's very, very innovative in itself for third sector support agencies. Very happy to have any sort of questions, of course, but uh, um, I, in particular, I want to know what we can do differently. How can we support you differently? What are we doing incorrectly? Very interested in terms of skills uh, and what have we missed? We have a wide range of provision there and we're very successful at that, but of course we could do better, particularly in STEM, but not only. I, I do want to know perhaps some of the softer skills that we can be instilling in our graduates, for example. And again, we've got a very um, sort of sophisticated and I think uh, a very broad uh, range of innovation support programs working with many, many SMEs, but what have we missed? Uh, um, what can we do better? How can we integrate with other programs going on perhaps to provide a full range of service and perhaps a ladder of support uh, for companies at different stages? Um, morning, everybody. And uh, good to see everybody here. And um, I, I thought, you know, the title, reflect back on the title of, uh, of today's event, Profiting um, from Innovation. And how did two blokes and a race car back in 2002 um, working out of offices at home uh, end up being uh, just a few years later in uh, 2000. Oh, here we go. Yeah, there is a delay, isn't there? In 2020 and now 2021, with uh, a, a facility at Silverstone. Um, and uh, funnily enough, still everybody working from home. Um, things have gone full circle on that, on that side. But how have we gone on that journey from? from two blokes in a race car to a, a digital manufacturing centre at Silverstone. And a lot of that's been through uh, innovation and um, being disruptive, being brave, and diversification, entrepreneurship, um, a little bit of luck and uh, quite a lot of help. And uh, I'll take you through some of those, some of those things that have helped us on that journey and explain how we ended up uh, where we are today. So it all started actually um, the, the, really the step change was back in 2012 2013 when we reached out to innovate uk um, to help us with developing a concept for a carbon fiber composite chassis platform for automotive applications that we we had the idea for for some time but we really didn't have uh, the, the the confidence i i guess and and the funding to to progress it into a, a purely um, internally invested R&D project. And we reached out to Innovate UK and we were successful in securing some money 
to develop a, a carbon fiber chassis platform. And that really was the step change. That's when we started becoming a business that invested in R&D, uh, in, in new projects and um, exploiting our innovative approach to, to things to, to build a business. And uh, quite quickly, uh, apart from moving on from being just a motorsport business, we set up KW Special Projects to look at, um, well, in order to, to facilitate exploiting our motorsport knowledge and technologies into other sectors. And along the way, we've, and I've picked some highlight projects really just to, to explain some of the things we've done, but along the way, um, we have uh, benefited from Innovate UK support and others. Um, our local enterprise partnership, which I'll come on to a bit later as well, with some significant um, assistance. But Innovate UK has been um, really, really beneficial to us in, in our innovation journey and innovation has helped us build the business. And really it's been around collaborative R&D. It's been around um, R&D technologies in the areas that we already kind of understood, but there were opportunities to develop new IP that you know, ultimately we need to use that IP to exploit and to, to, to build business, not just to invest in R&D. R&D costs you money. Out of that, you need to develop projects that, that make you money. Um, this is an example of, of one such project. It's actually quite a large project for, um, for an Innovate UK project for us to be involved in in terms of the number of collaborative parties. But it's um, been a long, a long project with a number of collaborators that has allowed us to develop IP in, in composites. So it's composite technology that we wouldn't normally have access to. Uh, we, we work in composites all the time in motorsport, but by doing this R&D activity around um, new technologies that gives us access into new sectors, new markets. So in particular, in this case, aerospace. Um, another example of a, a project that, where we are profiting from the innovation is uh, a project recently, which is due to complete quite soon actually, which is around additive manufacturing and development of uh, a new type of technology for printing or additively manufacturing ceramics. Now, this project, when it's complete, will actually spin out as a um, likely to be a separate business. We have already have routes to market as to where we're going to sell um, this technology and this, this capability into. We have collaborators in our, uh, in our project who are end users. And so there's pull through in our commercial exportation of this project. Um, and it's been made possible by de-risking the project by having some Innovate UK funding, but also the opportunity through Innovate UK has given us um, access to partners that we probably wouldn't have access to if we just went out looking ourselves. So we're, we're collaborating with MTC and with Lucidian and, and, and Kat and, and Emma Bridgewater, who are, who are all big players in, in this sector and, and working with Innovate UK and being, being a lead on the project gives us that credibility um, and and you know, the really important thing when you're looking at projects like this is making sure that you have a route to market. And, uh, and this one certainly does, and we're, we're quite excited about how this one might spin out. Another one, uh, which, which actually was completed a little while ago, but is very pertinent to the sector we're in at Silverstone, is around um, electrification and energy storage. And here we've used our, our knowledge in digital deposition to develop a new technology for making the components that go into batteries. So there's a lot of focus on battery packs and battery assembly uh, for electric vehicles and static storage. But this is, uh, is where we, we have our most interest is around automation and, and deposition technologies. And we identified some particular uh, weaknesses in current manufacturing technology that are quite old and don't have a very closed loop uh, quality system built into them. And we thought, well, there's probably a way in which we can we can uh, improve that using digital deposition and controlling every bit of the process, but we don't know any about batteries. So we went out again and looked for partners to collaborate on that R&D. And uh, part of the Faraday challenge, we then were hooked up with uh, Warwick Manufacturing Group who had the battery expertise that we were looking for. We brought the, uh, the deposition technologies to the, to the project. And interestingly, we, we've developed not only a machine that will um, improve the manufacturing process and give better quality and better yield, um, but we've also developed uh, some metrology out of it. So we've actually ended up with two projects out of one here. This metrology that we've developed around co um, coating thickness measurement in the loop of manufacturing has uh, other applications, not just 
uh, for, for battery manufacturing. So we've ended up with two bits of possible exploitation that we can profit from. Um, the, the next stages of the, the battery manufacturing project uh, are already starting to take shape where we will be looking at building a pilot line for that. Um, and then looking again for those uh, end use customers to exploit and pull through the project. But uh, you know, this, this, this is a true example of uh, how you can be innovative actually by not knowing an awful lot about the market sector you want to get involved in, uh, but by bringing in the correct parties to assist you. Um, the other side, uh, side story of this project actually is that as well as improving the manufacturing process, we've kind of accidentally discovered that there are other technical benefits of using digital deposition for the ink for making these electrodes and actually improves energy storage. So really exciting project and definitely one that we would, uh, we, we're expecting to spin out again as another business, um, either to attract further investment as an entity to, to bring this forward, um, or just so that we can exploit it and license it in a, in a neat neat manner rather than it being part of KWSP. But these, um, it's really important with your innovation journey to make sure that you do have, have an end goal. So that's led to over you know, a few years, a fairly steady um, business growth, a year on year in, increase in, in revenue. We're now at about 30 employees. We've had a bit of a dip actually with, with COVID uh, earlier last year, but we're now back up to, to about 30. We're, we're spread across two sites. Um, Silverstone and, and Vista. Silverstone will be occupying soon, in, probably within the next couple of months, uh, and, and over 25,000 square foot. So where we are now uh, with the digital manufacturing center, as I mentioned right at the beginning, all of this journey has allowed us to, to continue to invest because R&D needs to be balanced with commercial work and commercial opportunities and, and, uh, and, and funded and profitable work has led to us being able to invest in uh, the digital manufacturing center at Silverstone with substantial support from, from SEMLEP, our local enterprise partnership. And again, I think we only made that possible because of our presence and, and um, our evidence of sort of R&D and the sort of projects we've delivered in the past. Uh, so we are um, happy to say that we'll be moving into Silverstone later uh, this quarter, so in March. It's a purpose-built facility. Uh, this is one of the units that Ros showed in her slide earlier purpose-built facility for additive and digital manufacturing technologies. It's, um, it's, it's, it's littered with partners is probably the best description at the moment. We are now getting, um, we, we are fortunate enough that we've built such a credible project that we are able to, to pretty much choose who we want to work with on this. And you can see from, from our supporters at the top there in terms of um, the government support and the catapult supports, we've got significant um, traction with this project. Is some renders of what it might look like, well, what it will look like on the inside, it's starting to take shape now. Um, we will be additive and polymer, um, uh, metal and polymer additive manufacturing and the full service from engineering right the way through to, to delivery. And the key to this around um, Silverstone Park, Silverstone Technology Cluster, and, and how we work is by building those relationships I've talked about with partners. Um, so we're not just doing this all ourselves. Uh, we, we're, we're sharing the, uh, the, the workload with, with the partners from Renishaw to, to Progimax. So these people, uh, are getting, these businesses are getting involved with this project because they, want, they, they see the value in being part of this, this cluster and part of this sector and believe in what we're doing. And this will be a first of kind um, facility in, in additive manufacturing and digital manufacturing. And, and you know, for, for me personally, I think that's only been made possible by joining up the dots of the opportunities that are uh, around us here in this region. Um, we've got the Silverstone uh, Technology Cluster, which I'm very proud to be part of, but also Silverstone Park, the type of industries and businesses that are already based there and the ones that are coming to Silverstone um, and, and the support we've had from Innovate UK and, and from SEMLEF along the way. It's, there's no such thing as um, free money, it all takes a bit of effort to, to do it. And we've had to put in a significant amount of money, obviously to match all of this. This isn't a funded project, this is a part funded project. And uh, its objective will be that we will um, continue to, to reinvest um, our money into this, into this project. So very excited about that later this year. And um, perhaps just to end, uh, to close the session for me, uh, it's ending on a positive because it's been difficult times and let's talk about um, the investment. Someone mentioned it earlier. This, this is the time to invest actually. This is the time to, to do great things. Um, this is the time to, 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 to really be bold and, and, and make a difference because uh, 
everything's changed and you have an opportunity to change with it. So the DMC will be that. The DMC will be opening in March and uh, I'll just end on this little video if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. So I've been asked today to talk about my company and our little our little journey in 2020 and how what how COVID's affected us and and how we um, how we've been working with Bedford University and other universities to actually make a change in the business. So um, sorry, let me get that out of the way. I can just see myself. So for us, 2020 was all about survival. Um, we sort of woke up in sometime in March and April to discover that our um, traditional customers who are primarily um, we're contract manufacturers for other life science companies we do have a small um, customer base in in research but um, all research had sort of ground to a halt everybody was working from home and you can't do research from home so we realized we need to adapt um, think about things and I think one of the things about innovation that's always struck me is it's not a personal journey. It's a, it's it's all about collaboration and the people that you you network with and your and the team that you work with. Um, we do know that that funding is out there. I had a company previously, um, which was based in West Sussex, and. Um, I ran that for 10 years without even knowing that Innovate UK existed. Um, so it was moving up to moving this company up to Bedford and then suddenly realizing that there's this whole world of, of support out there has been, it's, it's been wonderful. So it's, um, it's something that we've, we're working with various groups with. So we've, we've had some help in funding. We have an Innovate UK grant out of the open COVID challenge. Um, and that is working with the University of Bedford, who've actually become a, a real perfect partner for us. Um, we work closely with um, one, of, one of the professors at, um, at the university, and we're currently working to develop an inactivation buffer for COVID-19 samples to enable people to actually take samples and transport samples safely, because at the moment, uh, the majority of samples are collected either in a transport media or in a saline buffer, um, but it does mean that those are, are still contagious whilst they're being transported. Um, Access to staff has been another thing. We've 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 worked with staff from the from the university, but also the region has for us has a, is a great resource for staff. I remember the challenges I had trying to find staff, especially trained staff in the Sussex area. Um, it's a completely different case up here in the, in in the southeast Midlands. We I think that Oxford Cambridge corridor means that you know you actually do have an ability to find some really good. Um, trained technical staff, not necessarily with all the academic qualifications that, um, that perhaps some people feel are necessary, but um, I think this comes down to what we were talking about, about skills earlier on. Um, we're quite, because we're, we're quite niche in what we do, it's um, in-house training tends to be what we're looking for, but we do like to, to take graduates who've got some sort of skills in, in either clean room or a regulatory environment, and that can be something of a challenge. Um, and Nick, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so where were we in March 2020? So we had 10 staff. We weren't working shifts and we didn't work weekends. Um, our customers disappeared, which was a bit of a worry. And so our standard manufacturing stopped. Um, and this wasn't just because we didn't have the customers, but also our raw materials 
um, sourcing dried up because as COVID spread across different geographies, um, we, a lot of our material is an abat abattoir source material. Those abattoirs were closing down and therefore raw material wasn't available to us. So in 2020, um, thinking about what we could do, I mean, here we were, we were a, a company that is very good about manufacturing sterile liquids um, and putting sterile liquids into bottles and looking at what public health were doing with um, with the COVID situation, we made contact with public health and said, here we are, what can we do to help you? So after a, some discussions, it was agreed that um, public health would allow us to fill tubes for the COVID-19 test kits. Um, so we, we actually manufacture one of the components for the, the public health kit, so the test and trace system. Um, we started discussions with the University of Bedford over the viral inactivation buffer. Um, because Robin Matum had actually written a paper um, which had been published echoing my thoughts. He, um, <clears throat> he shared the frustration of the fact that all these samples were traveling around, around the country that were still infectious and going through various couriers and postal systems when there was a way of actually inactivating the buffer at the time the sample the sample was taken. So we, um, we started those discussions and then in May um, because of our tube filling activities for public health, we had to, we had to um, become familiarized with the workings of the MHRA. We had to produce a technical file. We'd never done one of those in our lives. So that was a, a great learning curve. Um, we found ourselves a consultant who worked with us to create that. And our first orders came in through public health, which was 20,000 tubes a week, which you know, for us with two clean rooms running, that was a, a fairly good whack, whack. And we were, we were enjoying doing that. And then in June, they said, um, could you make some more? And we thought, well, yeah, okay, fine. So we started looking at um, how we could do that and tube filling increased to 100,000 tubes a week. And we released with Bedford University the first batch of, of a product we now call Inactivir, which was our first viral inactivation buffer, which we're quite proud of. So I've just, um, there's some photos here of um, what we're currently doing. So we have, when we moved up to 100,000 tubes a week, we invested, um, private investment, we invested in three semi-automated filling machines. Um, each one has a single operator and we started looking at um, running those on two shifts a day. Um, and that's a, this, because our current clean rooms, our, our fixed clean rooms, were couldn't actually take these machines under the class three hoods, we had to actually um, invest in some clean room bubbles. So this was our first clean room bubble, which was a class five clean room bubble, which actually was in our boardroom. So we moved the boardroom table out, popped the bubble in there, and um, we've been working in there ever since. Um, we then, in the second picture, moved on to um, we were initially we were asked not to label and then they said oh yes actually we'd like you to label so then we started looking at various different labeling machines and then we have the different ways of packaging it so what we needed to do was suddenly build ourselves a porter cabin village because we ran out of space inside i mean we already used the boardroom we had one more meeting room which was tiny that we couldn't possibly use for anything else so with the increased capacity we um had to suddenly start building a porter cabin village outside the outside our standard facility. So we have here <clears throat> various number of clean rooms, excuse me, <clears throat> housed in in porter cabins, and then we have separate porter cabins for packaging. And because of COVID and the fact that we need to keep manufacturing, we have three distinct teams working at any time who keep to their individual porter cabins and don't actually mix. So they're a color coded team system. So carrying on, um, in July, we had a problem with leaking tubes. The manufacturer of the tubes had a problem with the cap um, and we had to work with them to resolve that, which again was a learning curve for us. We'd never actually had to be involved in, um, in tube design or cap design. So it was an extraordinary um, period of, of, of innovation, if you like, to, to actually work out a solution to, to, to solve this. Um, it was a, a tube manufacturer that was unknown to us and was um, we were told by public health to use that particular supplier for tubes and um, it, it was it was a problem for them as well so but with collaboration with them we got through it. Um, we applied to Innovate UK for grant funding for new buffer formulations because public health validated our lovely inactive ear buffer 
um, and then told us to get ready and manufacture it, which we did, um, and then decided that they didn't like one of the components anymore so, because they felt that there was a risk in its use. So asked us to go away and think up some different buffer formulations. So um, we applied for, and were successful in receiving an Innovate UK grant for that. Um, High throughput was, I mean, it, throughput was increasing. We were continually being asked to up our production of, of saline tubes. So um, we had no option but to source machines from China because the lead time was um, five to six weeks as opposed to five to six months from manufacturers in the UK. Uh, there is a price to pay for having machines from China. They're not of the best quality and we are slowly replacing them with, with UK manufactured parts. But um, it, was, it did enable us to get up and running really, really, um, really quickly. Um, and that was all privately invested, uh, uh, private investment that we did through the through the business, through profit. So the Porter Cabin Village was constructed. And it, by December, we had um, four clean rooms functioning. We had three clean room bubbles and the two clean rooms, um, the two original clean rooms downstairs, although only one of them is actually working for the PHE project. Um, both the Chinese machines were commissioned and, and working and the contract moved from 200,000 a week to 900,000 tubes a week. Uh, we now have 46 staff working three shift, 24 hours a day, six days a week, and occasionally a seventh day if we need them. So the business has been quite dynamic over the last 12 months. We've, I mean, we've, we've, we have no space. We've, we have containers outside for packaging materials it's 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 extraordinary so we are looking for a new building we've identified one that we um that we can move into um it's increased our knowledge we have a completely new regulatory knowledge than we ever had um we've increased our technical knowledge and we've increased i think more importantly the contacts we have um which have, have, have been really worthwhile we've been talking to the university of bedford um about our new move and we are working with them for I think it was Stuart that mentioned earlier the um, the mentoring programs the 20 hours of mentoring so we've we've signed up for one of these with the University of Bedford to enable to look at us, our, our systems and to help us um, combine our systems automate our systems and really streamline what we do in preparation of move, moving into a new building we've um, achieved the first part of ISO 13485 so that wasn't on the horizon at the beginning of last year either so we will be a medical devices manufacturing company by the middle of the, the middle of 2021 um, which will take us into a whole new field of, of manufacturing it was something I always wanted to do but I didn't actually think that we'd actually get there this quickly so it's it's been a, a tremendous achievement um, we are actually looking and to work with companies who are developing um, lateral flow devices and we have um, some contracts working with them to work for COVID-19 projects but also projects beyond that um, because the different technologies that are coming out in lateral flow now will be applied to different diseases and different different infectious um, states so there is a a, a lot of opportunity there to to work with various companies to do that. I think the diagnostics industry in the UK is going to, I mean, it's, it will be transformed because of the, the, the last 12 months. We have a really, really strong team of people now, good management team, um, very proud of our staff. They've really pulled up to, um, from taking people that had no idea of what a cl clean room looked like and actually having them working shifts within a clean room now is, is, is a, is a wonderful thing to see so training's been a, a real focus yeah. for us for the last 12 months um so yes i mean access to funding is important as i say up until recently apart from we have one we have a ktp project working with coventry university um which is to totally unconnected to anything COVID or, or otherwise it's to develop a transport media for um cells for cell and gene therapy te technologies and we've been working with the cell and gene therapy catapult on that one um, so but no access to funding is always important and i think it's going to be necessary for us to move forward to develop into our medical devices um, which is where we want to be um, and then the plan is to put the company into employee ownership by the end of 2023 so that's my that's my dream so um, has anyone got any questions i think i saw one pop up um, 
what, what, what were my original plans for innovation in 2020? Uh, it's interesting. Well, yes, I mean, that was really to look at that the project that we're developing um, with KTP and Coventry University is due to finish in April this year. Um, and last year, the, the plan was to spin that out. Um, there's a couple of other products that we want to spin out at the same time with it, um, but that's been put on hold. It's still very much on the on the agenda, but yes, it's just taken a little back seat for the for the 12 months. Um, there's another um, there's an innovative product product that I want to develop with the company in the US as well. Again, been on the back back burner for the moment, but that'll happen this year. So thank you very much. So yeah, thank you, Julian. Very very pleased to be here, and thanks for inviting me. No pleasure. Thank, thanks, Jenny. It, it feels like you've been on a, a real roller coaster ride the last, well, it's last been, year. Um, it's been extraordinary. I mean, I've got there's a yeah, there's a funny little video here of one of our super duper Chinese machines making a okay, lot of noise. Okay, you're going to show the super duper video, and then we'll get uh, into the panel discussion. Or are you going to? I don't know whether it's going to play. They are Kieran. Eat your heart out with this one. Oh yeah, no, this is Kieran. This is your beauty. <laughs> I think yours is much better. I think this is going to run anyway. But basically, this is just this is one of the one of the mega Chinese machines that's now sitting in a porter cabin in a, in a plastic bag, basically. So um, it's a it's a fascinating piece of equipment. But I mean, yeah. it, it is fascinating that that um, uh, it, you know, as as a Innovate UK employee, I'm really impressed by your ability to pivot and get stuff done quickly. But my first degree was in planning. So when I saw the porter cabins, I thought, I hope she's got planning permission for all of those. <laughs> but yes. I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so so um, if we kick off, but so thank, thank you so much. I mean, there is another question for you from Anthony saying, please, could you say a bit more about the employee ownership scheme that you've got in mind? Yes, I mean, it's something I've been investigating over the last few years and it works very well for, I mean, most of the companies that are in employee ownership, I mean, there's the famous ones like, like the John Lewis partnership, but most of them tend to be small, um, small partnerships like um, architects or sort of dental surgeries, things like that. Um, but there, 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 there seems to be very few sort of larger businesses that, um, that, are, that are in employee ownership. So we're, the, the method we're looking at is really basically putting the majority of the shares into a trust um, and then having representatives from the, from the employee group acting as trustees. Um, and then sort of basically running it through that, running it that way. And then it's, it's, and that, that will enable me to step back. I mean, I'm getting to an age now where I'd like not to be working seven days a week. So um, be able to, it would enable me to pull back and enable them to, to step up and take over. So that's, that's the great plan. And I mean, it's, it's effectively, the company is the people that work for it. So um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it has to be to their benefit. I mean, it's, it's really interesting and, and a reflection both on what you've just said and also what Kieran was saying. It does feel like if, if, if you're an innovative company, then you innovate in almost all the things you do. So you've been, both of you have been developing new products, developing new processes for delivering those products. And also in Jenny's case, well, and, and Kieran in thinking about setting up new companies to take forward mm -hmm. ideas. So it's... You know, and the evidence would support that, that, that you know, you don't, you, if you're an innovator, you don't just think I'm going to innovate in that part of my life, you innovate no. across the whole thing. I think you're um, right. I think it's, I think it becomes a, a way of life. You know, you, mm. you, you've got, you know, you have your three year goal and your five year goal and it's just working out how you're going to get there and really not necessarily looking at what your competitor's doing, but just working out what's best for you, for your particular journey. Um, yeah. Gordon's just reminded me, and I'm sorry I didn't mention it earlier. Um, we did have assistance in a, and Gordon, you'll have to remind me what the name of the pro, what, what the name of the um, project was. But we took um, an apprentice really for I think it was six weeks of work, um, and that on a, in a marketing role. You can actually see that I didn't actually give him the presentation to do so. Um, but no, he's he's still with us, Gordon, and he's doing incredibly well. Um, he works remotely at the moment and he we took him on at the end of the project as a full time employee. And he's now in the process of buying a house in Bedford and moving up to Bedford because he likes the area and wants to be with us full time. So 
Um, Brilliant. I think it was time to grow, actually. Yeah, no, I think it was the time to grow. So thank you, Rachel. Yeah, and, and I mean, growing from 20,000 units, 900,000 units is... Oh, that was scary. Quite I mean, a growth seriously. Spurt. Quite a growth spurt. Um, okay. Well, Sorry. And uh, there's just one question actually from um, Anthony about re re recyclates. Yes, we would. Um, the problem we have at the moment in from our, for our sort of primary manufacture for our OEM clients is that they do rather insist that we use their bottles, which is a bit of a challenge. And um, some of them are PETG, which as we all know, are not very easily recycled. But we do think that's, that's beginning to change. And I'd welcome any, any suggestions in, in bottle manufacturers and people that we could go to and start validation on those. So. Uh, Kieran, um, maybe a slightly different take on that, although feel free to answer that direct question. Obviously, one of the issues around battery technologies is the whole life cycle analysis, isn't it? And, uh, you know, batteries might be green in some ways, but when you've got a large chunk of um, quite a complex uh, mix of materials to recycle, then it becomes maybe less environmentally friendly. How are you approaching those sorts of issues? Well, I mean, actually, one of the, one of the focuses for, the, for um, digitising the manufacturing process around batteries was... The, the issue of waste. So um, not a lot of people know this, but you know the, the current manufacturing process for batteries is, is basically um, web offset printing, which is developed for manufacturing tape back in the 60s. And uh, it, it really just manufactures in bulk and then you measure the, the quality uh, or performance of the battery at the end of the process and then you grade the batteries. And, uh, and you know with the current performance expectations on batteries, you can actually end up with quite a lot of waste. If you start digitizing the process and putting a feedback loop into the manufacturing process earlier on, you can make less batteries, uh, but higher performance ones. So it's it's around, and, the, and that's the whole thing around additive manufacturing actually, is that you only use the materials you need to use, or well, that's the objective. Um, so it certainly has the potential to be more energy efficient, um, more efficient on the use of materials, and um, and, and therefore there, you know, we would hope there would be some benefits. Cool. Thank you. And, and a, a question from um, John to you directly too, Kieran, about uh, you've obviously got a very uh, entrepreneurial and innovative mindset. How do you make sure that uh, all of your staff team uh, either have that at the outset or it's part of the company culture? And how do you reinforce that? It's really difficult. It's really difficult. And it's, it really is about you've got to create that culture from the top down, really. And, you know, it's it's it's. I, I tried to get involved um, with every project at, at the early stages and um, I hope my enthusiasm for innovation and, and alternative ways of thinking and being disruptive um, propagates through the company. I mean, we, we have a very flat hierarchy within the business and, uh, and we like to give everybody a voice and everybody um, the opportunity to come up with novel ideas. But it's, it's around selecting the people at the beginning and if you set up a business that... that um, Sort of shouts about being innovative, like I hope we do, and and being disruptive and and um, non-traditional. It attracts the sort of people that you want it to attract, and and that's what that's what we do. I mean, it doesn't always work. Some people don't quite get it as much as others, but you need that mix as well. You know, we we always say about um, you know sort of the the experience um, spread across the business. Also, you need to have lots and lots of young people with novel ideas and, and that naivety of, um, uh, of their experience that says, well, actually, why are you doing it that way? Why, why can't we do it this way? Um, and you need, you need those young people and those young voices, but you also need some grown-ups with some experience and, and, um, and that knowledge to pass on and pass down. And that's how you get the interesting and challenging conversations and the proper discussions where you come from two different um, points of view but actually end up creating something that, that hadn't been done before. If you do it the old way, being in silos and say, we've always made cars this way, you'll carry on making the same cars. Yeah, I think that's a really important point about having that mix. And it relates a bit to, uh, I think it might have been John again, he's, uh, he's really helping me out here and asking the questions to Nick about what's the university doing to engender those sorts of problem solving, critical analysis skills in its graduates. Yeah, I saw that question. Thanks for coming back to that. I thought it was an excellent question. I think, you know, a, a few years ago when I was at university, 
um, you know, you did your three years undergrad and then they opened the doors and sort of said, fly away little birds and, and good luck to you. And I, I think really, you know, that, that probably hasn't gone on for quite some period of time. And then there was a bit of a transition. Uh, a lot of um, that was around extracurricular support for, for graduates to have sort of critical thinking, entrepreneurial skills. But I think in the last 10 years, we've really looked to embed that quite dramatically. And that's probably with an upscale in industrial panels, sitting on curriculum, sitting on courses, working with faculties, telling us, well, that's what they need. Hence my earlier comments about, you know, from Ros and um, Stuart saying, uh, well, you know, we're perhaps providing graduates that don't really get some of those skills. Well, that's really what we're trying to address. And so embedded in the vast majority of our courses now are critical thinking skills, our entrepreneurial skills, et cetera, et cetera. So that's something we're really trying to address at a very fundamental level and not just have it sort of bolted on in terms of extracurricular activity or when you finish, you finish your degree, you know, have it tacked on by a career service. We know that really doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't apply in critical thinking skills entrepreneurial skills, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, there are generic skills, of course, but a lot of it is very context specific to, to, to particular uh, um, uh, courses. So having that embedded, we're finding particularly useful. But if that's not working, we need to think more about that, then that's what we want to hear uh, um, from businesses in particular. And I think things like high degree apprenticeship programs that are absolutely business led, they're telling us we need to start thinking more about that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, th th that, that's kind of my answer there, Julian. Cool, thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, a question which is probably for, for Kieran uh, and then Jenny, th this question of diversification. So both of you started off uh, uh, doing, doing one thing and you diversified away from that. And I suppose the question is, is what was the driver for that? Um, and, and really any reflections on, on the, the challenges of doing that? Kieran, yeah. maybe you first. I mean, we've, we've had both both scenarios of um, diversification through necessity and diversification um, deliberately. Um, most of our business has been by, has been diversification through choice and, and, and a deliberate act. You know, we, when I set out in 2002, I'd been a motorsport engineer, race car designer for 10 years and, and, and not much else. Although in that time, I had been involved in designing an airline seat for, for Virgin Atlantic because it used composites, because it was lightweighting. Um, but when we set up KV Motorsport, you know, I, I recognised that Motorsport in its own right was quite a fragile, volatile business and, and we needed to, to diversify from a business point of view. But also, as an engineer, I wasn't, it wasn't just Motorsport that, that motivated me, it just happened to be a good place to be an engineer. So I liked engineering across the board um, and problem solving. So it was the objective then to, to diversify and collaborative R&D made that possible and made that much easier. Um, to do that and there's a recognition now um, which was kind of pioneered by the, the IET several years ago around horizontal, horizontal innovation and, and sort of flattening out those silos and being less silo driven as, as sectors and saying that every sector probably has something to offer to another sector in terms of innovation. So that bit was deliberate. Uh, like Jenny back in, in March last year we, did, we diversified um, through necessity as well. Uh, we had some, quite a few projects that were paused or, or dried up completely around that time. Um, and we got involved in some PPE at that time and we designed a, a, a novel face mask um, with uh, we're using filter systems out of an automotive sector rather than the filter systems that were unavailable at the time um, due to the, the, the sudden demand. So, you know, we've, we've done both. And I think that's just a, an example of how, I guess, our, our minds work, which is we're just problem solvers all the time. Um, and... And actually, we're not really business people. I'm not very good at the business people stuff. You know, if I wanted to go out and make profit, I could probably be much more effective at it than I currently am. Yeah. Um, but by making, but hopefully, I make some money accidentally as a result of doing the other stuff, which is, you know, the, the fun bit, I guess. <laughs> Great, <Absolutely>. thanks, <laughs> Jenny. Any thoughts from you? I mean, absolutely. What he said. Um, <laughs> it's. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there, there's diversification through necessity, which was was definitely where we were last year. And there's also, um, I think, an aware diversification because you've got an awareness of where the your industry is heading and where it will be in five years and ten years, and you want to be slightly ahead of the game. And I think that's your long term planned diversification. Um, but I completely echo. I mean, if I was a, a, a brilliant business person, I'd probably be 
sitting under a palm tree somewhere on an island. But we're not. We like making things, basically, and um, we enjoy what we do. And um, I enjoy passing that knowledge down through through the team of people that we have working for us. And and that's really sort of where I get my satisfaction from. So, um, no, it's a, it's interesting. But Kieran, we definitely got some things in common. <laughs> so. 2023 is when the palm tree will be beckoning by the sound of it. Well, I doubt that very much. <laughs> so do I. So muddy Hereford. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, I don't think we've got any more questions come through. Uh, so um, uh, I'm... I'm if anybody wants to come in like Kieran, I'm sure if anybody wants to contact me privately, just email me. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. Happy to talk to anybody or give yeah, any. That's great. Appreciate that. So so um, your last chance while I'm uh, chuntering on uh, to ask questions. Otherwise, we'll wrap this session up. Uh, thank you so much to Nick, Kieran and Jenny. Uh, a really, really great session and just some really inspiring stories from all three of you about the way in which universities are responding to um, the needs of, of the economy and wider society uh, and Jenny and Kieran for your really inspiring sort of uh, stories about the way in which your businesses have developed and grown and um, you know it's great to know that uh, you've both managed to survive this awful <laughs> crisis and if anything are sort of benefiting a bit from it. Um, I'm still waiting so uh, I will definitely wrap up now so thanks again. Um, uh, two things, there is the exhibition immediately after this, so I know that I'm available to have chats with people for an hour uh, after this. Uh, that's just going back to the main site and then coming back in into the exhibitors. Probably you've heard enough of me, so go and talk to some of the other exhibitors rather than to chat to me. Um, uh, also, uh, we'll be back uh, tomorrow morning, so we've got almost a full day of sessions tomorrow uh, looking at... Uh, working with universities to commercialise uh, both their ideas and your ideas, so building on some of the stuff that Nick's been talking about, uh, a separate session about some of the infrastructure opportunities there are within within the ARC and SEMLEP to get involved in using us, uh, using the region as a test bed for new ideas around sustainability, smart infrastructure, smart cities, and then there's a session on um, finance for innovation in the afternoon. So lots going on tomorrow. Uh, so uh, please do have a look at the exhibition or join the exhibition today, have some one-to-one -one conversations. And if I don't see you in my little chat room later on, uh, look forward to seeing uh, you all tomorrow morning uh, at 9.30. Thank you all very much.